Welcome to Stanford Law School. My name is Roberta Morris. I'm a lecturer in uh, various subjects like intellectual property, and I have a long-standing interest in keeping the public and public domain. Um, and this is not only Stanford Law School, it's also the first workshop uh, in a series of workshops of law.gov. Um, and as I understand it, although Carl Malamud is about to tell you uh, the truth, um, but as I understand it, the purpose of these workshops is to come up with a report to give Congress to authorize public access to what the public has in fact already bought and paid for, and you might even say created as members of a uh, democratic society, and that is the laws of the country, the federal laws, the state laws, the municipal laws, the county laws, all of those laws. Um, we all learned at an early age that ignorance is no excuse for the law, and yet Yet, nevertheless, if we try to relieve that ignorance, we find a wall of law, copyright, contract, um, and other rights that are trying to prevent us from relieving our ignorance and therefore from giving us no excuse or something. Um, but the law, um, we, we would like the law.gov workshops uh, as beginning here to provide this report to Congress so that we can change how things are. Um, the first speaker is Carl Malamud. He is the president and founder of publicresources.org and the initiator, motivator, and uh, uh, grand pangendrum of law.gov. And he will tell you what it is. He's actually not a lawyer. His background was in economics. Um, but since then, he's gotten very interested in the rights of the public to their laws. And he holds awards from Harvard, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and the First Amendment Coalition. The next speaker going across the table is Anurag Acharya. Um, Anurag was originally a computer scientist, a faculty member at the University of California at Santa Barbara. His undergraduate degree is from the Institute of Technology at Kharagpur, and his PhD is from Carnegie Mellon and his postdoc was at Maryland, but he's really known to all of you and beloved for that reason as the co-founder of Google Scholar um, and the benefactor of humanity thereby. Um, the next and last uh, speaker today is Jonathan Zittrain, who probably needs no introduction to this crowd. He's well known as the author of the book, The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It. His undergraduate degree is from Yale. His, his law degree is from Harvard. He's a member of the faculty at Harvard. Uh, and he's written quite a bit in scholarly um, publications and Non, not so scholarly publications, and I know him and have been a fan of his for about 15 years when he gave a talk about how you could use the notions of fair use and other copyright ideas to protect the confidentiality of medical records. Uh, I thought he was the best speaker a law school had ever seen, and today he's going to get a little competition, but in the 15 years I've known him, there has been no competition. Uh, so without further ado, <laughs> <laughs> without further ado, I will turn the podium over to Carl Malmud. Uh, thank you, Roberta. Um, I'd like to thank Stanford for hosting the first law.gov workshop. As Roberta said, uh, this is a nationwide process uh, that is um, undergoing. Um, I don't know if you folks know, but in the 1970s, uh, the law began to go online. And that initial impetus actually came from the United States Air Force. They decided as part of the, um, the adjutant general corps, the folks that do law for the Air Force, that they needed legal materials on these mainframe computers. And they sat a bunch of flyboys down in front of, of, of punch cards. And they started to type in um, the United States code and court opinions. And that was a system called flight. And that became a system called Juris, which was actually operated in the 1980s by the Department of Justice. At the same time, the Ohio Bar decided they would also use these newfangled computers, and they began putting information online, and that ended up becoming a company called LexisNexis. Um, and what happened in the late 80s is the federal government decided they really didn't need to originate this information anymore. And by that time, they had two million pages in their Juris database. It was being used by Department of Justice. And they deleted all two million pages. And this was in the days when two million pages was a lot of data. <laughs> and they ended up cutting contracts with West and Lexus. Now, in the early 90s, there were a few far-sighted pioneers, uh, the folks at Cornell LII, who you probably use their system for the US code. Uh, Tim Stanley founded Find Law. And there were people that decided the internet was a place that legal materials of the United States could become available. And so this is not a new concept, and for the last 15 years there have been people trying to do things. 
And for the last three years, that movement, I think, has become national. Uh, there's a group called Alt Law out of Columbia and, um, and uh, Colorado that put together a beautiful system for navigating codes. Uh, the Cornell folks have been moving along. There's an OEA project out of Northwestern that does Supreme Court materials. Uh, my organization, Public Resource, has posted about 90 million pages of government documents on the internet. So today, if you want to read a building code or a fire code or if you want to read a court of appeals decision, um, you just drop the citation in Google and you'll find there's a dozen, dozen different places that are available. Law.gov is an effort to bring that effort up to the next level, is to try to see whether we can get the federal government and the state government to originate and digitally sign all the primary legal materials, the materials that have the force of law. And you may say, why now? Well, part of it is because this national movement has begun. But also because we happen to have a president who um, used to teach constitutional law. Our solicitor general was a dean at Harvard Law School. Um, the head of e-rulemaking in the Office of Management and Budget was a distinguished professor at the University of Chicago. And if you look at the efforts in Washington, things like data.gov, there is obviously an, an effort to put more information online. And it seemed like the time was right to convince first the federal government and then the states and the municipalities that the time is right for them to create a system that we're calling law.gov. And the point is that government should originate their own data. And now technically what that means is we think government should operate a registry and a repository for bulk access to all primary legal materials in the United States. This doesn't necessarily mean that West and Lexis are going to be replaced. And I think those companies would face what I call an IBM moment in which they can thrive and prosper because uh, huge new markets have been opened up and access to the primary materials no longer becomes a big impediment to getting in the business. Uh, so this is partly about innovation. This is about allowing new startups, allowing people like Google to decide to put legal information online and not necessarily have to spend millions of dollars. Now, Google can spend millions of dollars, but your average startup in a dot-com and your average public interest research group doesn't have access to that material. Uh, this is a big business today. Um, let me give you a couple statistics. Uh, the federal government spends $250 million a year just from the executive branch accessing primary legal materials. The PACER system, which is district court documents, is a $100 million a year revenue stream. Uh, Erica Wayne here at Stanford did a survey of 66 law schools, and 63 of them do not allow students to access the PACER system on a regular basis. That means when you're studying the law, you can read opinions, and if you happen to be a Supreme Court clerk, you're going to know how to write those opinions. But most of you are going to end up writing briefs and you can't access our federal trial court system where all those briefs are located. Um, just as importantly, if you're a public interest group or a legal researcher and you want to download a lot of district court documents, it costs a tremendous amount of money at eight cents per page. What my organization found when we were able to access 20 million pages of PACER documents is we were able to audit them for privacy violations. To no surprise, there were huge privacy problems in the PACER system. We did an audit of 30 district courts, sent the audits to the chief judges, sent it to the judicial conference, and a few months later, after a Senate investigation, they ended up changing their privacy rules. And so access to the law has effects that, that are way more than simply allowing a few pro se prisoners to access documents. It's really about the basic functioning of our legal system. It's about equal protection. If you look at court cases that say you can't charge people to vote, that's an equal protection issue, right? Uh, charging people to access to the law to me is just as fundamental. It's a violation of due process. It's a violation of, of equal protection. It's what turns us from a, a nation of laws to a nation of men where you can only access the law if you have the right pocketbook. Now that sounds a little bit ideological, um, but I think it's a fundamental issue that, that the government should originate its materials that we all have to obey. 
So let me tell you a little bit about the law.gov process. Uh, this is a year-long process and it has three phases. We're beginning with six months of workshops to try to talk about these issues. What would it take to get the government to make material available? What materials are we talking about? We, we are originating, in fact, here at Stanford, something called the National Inventory of Legal Materials, in which librarians across the country are systematically cataloging what are the legal materials, where are they, are there copyright restrictions, are there privacy issues, are there other things we need to worry about? These workshops are going to be not only here at Stanford, there's one next week at Princeton, there's going to be one at Columbia University in mid-February that's being hosted by Tim Wu and Clay Shirky. We are currently scheduling uh, workshops at Harvard, at Berkeley, at Duke, at the Center for American Progress, uh, where my old boss John Podesta is going to be hosting that one. Um, that's actually kind of a big deal in Washington, D.C. Podesta ran the transition effort for President Obama. Um, we are hoping that having not only people like, like Professor Zittrain and Professor Lessig and many others from around the country helping us put this together, but also having insiders in Washington being part of the process, that we, we will have a chance at least at getting this, this um, our results heard. So process, part one of the process are these workshops for six months. Part two this summer is going to be the drafting of a report with detailed specifications on what it would take for the government to run such a system. Um, it is my belief that if the government had primary legal materials more readily available, it would save the federal government a billion dollars over a 10-year time period, over access to their own materials and little side effects like democracy and justice and things like that. And so the, the hope in the summertime is to write that report with detailed specifications, detailed technical specifications as well, about how one could build such a system based on open source software and open standards. And what that means is that this registry of the law could live in multiple places. So even if the federal government were to run one registry, the states could use that same software and run their own registries as well. Uh, likewise, in the federal government, if, if the three branches can't agree on a single place uh, that runs their registry, they could run a series of these things. Phase three is very simple. This fall, we're going to hit Washington, and we're going to try to sell this idea. Uh, we've had very good reaction so far. Um, Senator Lieberman, on behalf of the Senate, has asked for a copy of this report to be deposited to his committee. Um, I've been in discussions with Speaker Pelosi's staff and several other folks on the relevant committees in the House. Uh, people in the White House have been extremely receptive to this idea and are willing to listen. And so we have a unique opportunity in front of us to actually change a fundamental part of our legal system and we're ho hopeful that, that this process at the end of the year will yield something real like legislation introduced into Congress and passed. Um, even if that doesn't happen, even if we fail, I think the, the year-long discussion is a useful one to have. So I want to turn this over to Anurag now who has um, taken these legal materials and actually done something with it and I think he's going to give you a little demo. Hi. Uh, I may get up and walk around um, <laughs> since that's easier for me to talk to. Um, so I'll be talking about the system that we have built. Um, such as the train knows her law all knows about making things happen. I will talk. Um, the goal that and I'm talking in terms of uh, what goals we had and how we have tried to achieve them. If you can't hear me in the back, then say so and I will speak louder. So the first, and to some extent not surprising goal, given where I work, which would be really, really, really simple to implement, relevant data. That's sort of the part that we started out with Google Scholar. Scholar is a little bit different in the sense uh, from uh, what used to be Scholar slightly different in the sense that, yes. Yeah. Significant fraction of the content in the scholarly space is for pay. And free versions do not, they are not available. So the basic premise that we started with was that you should at least be able to find the relevant material what you are able to read will depend on your relationship with whoever 
has whatever copies, whatever versions, whatever happens to be available. So everyone, anywhere, no matter where, which organization they are affiliated to, what background they have, it should be possible to at least find everything. The second part is be able to, when I say find, not just find, but find everything that is relevant. In this case, for law, it is all case law, all law reviews, all books, all in one place. So that no matter which direction you want to go to, you can understand what the space looks like. Of course, there are times when you need to be able to limit the subsets. Law is particularly, not particularly, somewhat unusual in this respect compared to uh, the rest of the legal space. There is no notion of jurisdiction. Uh, if there's a theorem in mathematics, there's a theorem in mathematics everywhere. Uh, same doesn't necessarily apply here. So being able to restrict is far more important here than, the, than a similar ability elsewhere. Normally in sc scholar, before we add to the law, for all the other areas, we do not have ability to restrict on a sub-area or sub-area basis. We did add the ability to, add, to restrict to just broad areas, seven different areas that we identified that people may be interested in using to restrict. We found that over the last four years, nobody used them at all. Here, of course, things are different, so we have taken. So there's two, when, when, when you say it should work for everybody, what does it really mean? So once it's starting out from people who have the least familiarity, simple queries that an average person would use should just work. You type it in and it goes. You shouldn't have to know which database to go to. You shouldn't have to know which part of the ontology it happens to fall within or to understand what magic terms happen to apply to give you these right answers. So um, I, let me go back to click on the wrong thing. You type in abortion, you should get what are at this point the leading authorities as well as what happen to be the historical authorities. If you type in, well, let's stop, you should get Terry versus Ohio. If you type in separate but equal, you should get both board, Brown versus Board of Education and Plessy versus Ferguson. You shouldn't need to do anything else. You can do. Uh, just for fun, not really fun, but Bang It's for Jesus, and this is, I don't know if people are familiar with this case, this is a case about um, free speech on school property. What can, what can you and cannot say when you happen to be on school? So this is, this allowing something like this to work makes it possible for people who are not familiar with the intricacies of law to at least begin to explore. If, if I read something in the news, if I hear something at the water cooler, can I begin to understand, can I begin to not, maybe not understand, can we begin to look around? Then, the other parts of everyone is, can I make it possible for people who know what they're doing? Somewhat easier, without having to fill in the giant search box set, which everybody usually likes to put together in a advanced search page with 17 different search boxes. Can I make it easy for people, even professionals or scholars or students, to use a service like this without having to think too much about it? So you want Roe v. Wade, you know who, what Roe v. Wade is, you, it means something to you, and 410 US 113. You shouldn't have to do anything else, it should just work. You can do by party, automatically, to the extent that you can interpret a query. You shouldn't have to say party colon. You shouldn't have to put it in a separate box. If I can interpret the query in a mostly unambiguous and most likely to satisfy the user way, then I should.
I mean, this is, in, in spirit, this is no different from what Google does. You type in a query, and we figure out what this is, what is the most likely set of results that you will likely want. There are different, and the kinds of queries you do, to some extent, allows me to do this. If you do 410 US 113, you are not an average person. <laughs> um, that is not negative. That is not negative. <laughs> You can also do by author. Author is different kinds of author. There's authors of opinions, there's authors of books, there's authors of law review articles. If you want to figure out, if you want to follow scholarship, you're a researcher, and your interest spans the entire space, you should be able to do this. The next goal, and this is sort of unusual for us in this space, it should be easy to read once you get there. You should be able to, to the extent possible, the thing should be easy to sort of go through and read. Uh, law opinions can be kind of long and kind of structured and involved. So the question is, what can you do to make it somewhat easier? So the first thing is they are heavily cited. They, are based on precedent. They talk about why this is a good argument. You should make it possible and easy to follow the rationale that is being used. So if there are citations within, within a case, it should be just trivial to click and go. That's the way the web works. It should work here, too. It is possible that different versions and different locations have different amounts of information. The version of case law that we make available have no summaries, no head notes, just the opinions. It is possible that some of the other versions have more information, possibly the one at Cornell, possibly some of the older uh, examples at resource.org. They have additional information. So we're not the only place where you can find this. There are many places where you can find this, so you should make it as easy as possible to get to every location, every version readable version of the case. And for the next two, I'll just use this as an example. As you go down, you got footnotes. You should be able to go down and go back up. It should be easy, because footnotes originally, the, what we are presenting here is basically things that, are that were at least at times, published in books. Footnotes in books were somewhat easier to follow, maybe not trivial, but somewhat easier to follow. Now, what you have done to them, essentially, is to reflow the entire text so that there is a big, long chunk of things, and there's footnotes at the end. You could choose to do it differently. You could continue to keep the pace, the pagination. That, in some sense, makes it harder for you to read a flowing article. So the idea is to preserve the footnote characteristic. You allow the footnotes to go back and forth. Yes, please. I'm sorry. This is an additional version that you're doing by, with your own hands? Um, this is a version that we are making available. <laughs> this, is not, this is not from scanning. Where did it come from? This is not from scanning. We have purchased this. Okay. Thank you. This is not from scanning. And the other is, as you can see, as you scroll down at the top, the context, the case that you're reading, is sort of displayed so you don't lose the context as just because you're scrolling the, as I said, the opinions are kind of long. And as you're exploring lots of them. Number two, there is a variable loss. Which one? It's just a little dyslexia. Um, there are many sources of <laughs> dyslexia. Wiki, right? What? Uh, yes, we could do it with the wiki. Wiki brings in a yet another different set of problems. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what I was demonstrating. You should be able to sort of quickly get two footnotes, quickly get back so that you can go, give me a second, um, go off when you need to and continue your, con your reading or in your flow when you want and see the context. Yes, please. Excuse me? So do you have other law besides At this point, we, are, we have only United States law. 
the next thing is, what can we do to help people explore and understand? And once you try to do it for everybody, this becomes uh, surprisingly complicated. So we take baby steps. Some of the steps that are easy given what we have already been doing, and some of the things that are unusual that we are doing specifically for case law. So the first is you should be able to get whoever is citing this. If law reviews are talking about a case, we should be able to get those law reviews. If cases have cited this case for other purposes, we should be able to get that. If books do that, we should be able to do that. So you can see who's citing a relatively recent case which you might be familiar with. This is the case, the marriages case in the California Supreme Court, which said it is okay, gay marriage was okay. Uh, that's a very broad way of saying it, but please understand. So you can sort of see quickly. In I'm, I'm, some ways, I was very pleasantly surprised that relatively recent opinions have, um, are very highly cited. Uh, you could. The other thing we do is we try to figure out, independent of the direct citations, what are likely related articles, related cases, related documents to any given article or case. So this is basically taking the Wong Hits for Jesus case and saying what's related to this. And you will see a lot of them, of course, are to deal with school districts. We look at you know, what the citation patterns are between the cases, what the text is, to figure out what is likely related. Some of these cite each other, but not all of them do. Because it turns out to not everybody relies on the same authorities to reach possibly similar conclusions. The so next thing, so these two scholars always had. They've always had the ability of being able to find what is cited. We've always had the ability of trying to get, estimate what might be likely related articles. What we have done special, unusual here for case law is to give users a way of trying to see what, how has this case been frequently cited? What have people used this to argue for, argue against, establish? And it can be surprisingly useful for a person with not as much I mean, it could be very useful for professionals and researchers as well. I'm not able to judge that as well. And maybe one or some of you can tell me. But for, as, as a computer science person, which is basically as hopefully one of the educated citizens, for me to be able to click on that, and I will show you some examples, um, it tells me what impact this case has on me, why I should read it, and what is the core of this case, without having to construct this. Let me show you this. So let's look at Roe v. Wade. Um, there's the longer version and there's the shorter version. The shorter version is the, it's for the first trimester, the right to abortion is absolute. Right or wrong, that's basically what, has been, what this case has been used to argue. Plus, the notion that the right of privacy is an, can be derived from the Constitution. This is all done automatically by analyzing how this case has been cited in other cases, or in articles, or in books. Another one, Terry versus Ohio. When can, uh, what is reasonable for grounds for a police officer to stop? And it says pretty much exactly what the Terry stop is. Yes? For me, Um, so it's not intended to be structured. I would like to understand what structure would help with. Um, purpose here is to say what has this been used most often to establish. Now, if there's further restrictions that would help understand this, we would be happy to explore that. But point, am I right? The point one might not be very closely related to point two, but 
That is not intended. That is not intended at all. What point one is the most frequent. Point two, and what we do, second thing we do is we, you click on it, we take you to the portion of the case, excuse me, it's, it's too light here, it doesn't display clearly, it's way at the bottom. It just takes you to the portion of the case where the citation happens and shows you the context around it. So you can say how it is cited and in what context. What else have people said about it around it? So what next? I mean, this is all baby stuff to be for some parts of it. Um, well, one is for to increase coverage, especially for older cases. At this point, we are uh, for federal cases since 23, for Supreme Courts, uh, everything, and state courts since 1950. Um, that's not all of case law. The second is, what more can we do? And I'm sure there's tremendous amounts of things more we can do to make law accessible. This is sort of the first baby step. Making it possible for people to read, making it easy for people to read, making it possible for and easy for them to find will allow people who are really interested to sort of spend enough, enough time to figure this out. Can you make this even easier? I would love to brainstorm with people, people who have a lot more experience with this area than I do, which is not very much at all. Thank you. Jonathan? This may be one of those identifiable moments where we are at the cradle of an idea. Uh, not the birth, but the cradle. Uh, an opportunity to brainstorm before a whole lot of track has been laid down. And that's often the most fun part of having the idea, because you're not yet fully hemmed in by the that's great, because the more you let yourself be hemmed in by reality, the less likely you are to be able to change them at this stage. So I think Anurag and Carl have spoken and shown us a little bit of some of the possibilities that can come when all sorts of information is made free for anyone to do the review. They've also talked a little bit about some of the known unknowns questions we have to answer if there is to be a persuasive case made to everyone else not to do about why this should happen, privacy, not the least, among them. And then there are also the unknown unknowns, the Rumsfeldian unknowns, <laughs> that will come up. Whenever you try to do something as profound and revolutionary as what, in fact, is actually being proposed, one of the great moves is to take something as revolutionary as this is and be able to make it seem and be inevitable, natural, incremental, when in fact it is so much more. So it's great to see so many numbers here today and the energy brought into the room built around a common idea of trying to take this information, as Roberta said, that's already really the public's and make it genuinely so. Now, I'm, I study cyber law, whatever that means. Part of what it means is studying the actions and dynamics of just one or two people who have an idea and manage to get it started and within an incredibly short period of time sometimes have completely transformed the landscape. I study people like Peter Tatum, who is an academic at the University of Tasmania. He was a support staff in the psychology department. He was somebody who, in the early 1990s, was interested in using his Windows machine to get onto the nascent internet. He built something called Trumpet Windsock to do that. Nobody knows how Trumpet Windsock actually works. It's just you follow to the letter the instructions to get it going, and you could get Windows 3.0 on the internet. And just, I don't know what's going on, but somebody in Tasmania has given me shareware to make this happen. And it was 
only the second release of Windows 95 where Bill Gates thought it worthy enough to build this functionality in on the shoulders of someone like Peter Tatum. In more recent examples, you look at Facebook or Twitter or even Google, and you see how just a couple people with an idea, even in a field where people know it's going to be significant, like search, and make it happen when the incumbents and the most logical parties to build into it have failed. Even the World Wide Web itself fits this template, right? A guy named Tim sets up a server and some suggestions as to how others could set up their own servers and clients, making a World Wide Web of, right, the guy's crazy. <laughs> it's just, what level of confidence do you need to try to do something like that and name it so capaciously? And, you know, we're not talking today about the people who made the waste, <laughs> the wide area information system, or remember Gopher, like that's, mm -hmm. you know, there are many fits and starts. And it's interesting to me to hear Carl say, you know, it may not work. But even if it doesn't work, it's the fits and starts that later give rise to the thing that does, which is why I am so confident that even if this does not directly result in something comprehensive in a short time, it is a huge building block to that end. Um, other non-incumbents that come to mind that have managed to really change the way the world works, a guy named Brewster, who just decides to start scraping the web and keeping track of everything because we might want it someday. And that's the Internet Archive, the Wayback Machine. Now, we could actually have an interesting discussion as to whether it's possibly a big copyright infringement <laughs> or the biggest copyright <laughs> infringement ever, right? I mean. The Google Books folks can tell you what happens sometimes when you start scanning everything <laughs> and give an opt-out as the way of assuming permission. Of course, that's exactly what the Internet Archive does. It was incredibly vulnerable when it first started, <coughs> less so now because it's just so damn useful. At this point, if the case were brought very similar to the template of the Google Books case, saying, hello, the Internet Archive is a rank infringement of copyright. It is scraping entire sites and keeping them forever unless they opt out. That's not allowed, not a fair use, prima facie infringement. But now it's the court that in agreeing with that would be wreaking havoc with the status quo rather than the other way around. An incremental change that turns out to be revolutionary and then just turns out to be the status quo. What a great template to follow. And I see hints of that in the presentation some of you may have seen yesterday from Steve Schultz about recap, which is let's get access to this data that is ours through Pacer and then through a plugin make it available to others to save them money that they won't have to pay to the government. And you know the people at Pacer are having a cow. <laughs> Is it illegal? I, I don't know, probably not. We'd have to throw a trial to find out. Nobody wants yet to do that, and in the meantime, the status quo is evolving, and every day that recap exists is another day that the republic has not fallen, at least for that reason. <laughs> and it becomes part of a status quo from which everybody can benefit. So with the law.gov enterprise, the kinds of issues we have to take up are partly, I guess you might call them evangelical, how to increase the salience and relevance of this project to people that otherwise don't think it bears upon them, how to persuade people in a position to make it happen, including legislators and members uh, of the other branches to be supportive of the vision behind it. But also, I think it involves a really frank and detailed discussion about issues like privacy, one of the known unknowns. What happens when you take a huge mass of documents that are nominally public, could go to the basement of the courthouse and get them, but no one does unless there's some particular media interest. And when those are as searchable, as enthusiastically as you know, Anarag will make them, 
You can just do a search on a name. He's like, well, we assume you want the social security number, right? That's the most salient result. Now, we know that the Google web search, we know that the Google web search actually excludes social security numbers, which is what- add to that. Yes. If you see social security, if you identify social security numbers and non-public telephone numbers in the case law that we make available, we redact it. In other words, we can fix that. Same with us and same with Tim Stanley and all the other folks doing the free law on the internet. We actually all work together on privacy issues, unlike the commercial providers and the courts who do not respond to these types of queries. Sorry. So as you can see, these are extremely known unknowns for which work is being done to fix it. We also know, certainly to keep the privacy example alive for another moment, that all it takes is one well-positioned oops and the transformation of the landscape towards closed can take place. Those of us who are aware of the hasty passage of the Driver's License Data Protection Act or the Video Rental Protection Act can point to the exact incident that gave rise to it rather than be curious about how these two things became so singularly important with respect to privacy protection uh, compared to everything else. Then there are, uh, again, the unknown unknowns. There's a stay in effect until tomorrow. Who knows what will happen next there in the Prop 8 case, which was about to be webcast on YouTube, right? I, can't, I imagine all of us couldn't wait to see the comments from the YouTube community. <laughs> <laughs> LOL, <laughs> nice tie, you know. As you make this stuff open, and truly anything can happen, and it's often the thing we didn't plan for or expect that can turn out to be the most useful or interesting. And finding out how to walk through some of the concerns that have been raised, at times by one set of parties, at times by another, in cases like the Prop 8 case, these are great and difficult questions. I don't pretend to say that just turning the dial all the way towards let it all out is the way to go, and my sense is these guys don't either. But we wouldn't want that to be an argument for status quoism. I remember in the Eldred case, one of Chief Justice Rehnquist's questions to the plaintiffs who wanted to argue about the unconstitutionality of retroactively extending the term of copyright was he said, let me get this straight. Petitioners want the right to copy other people's work for free, right? Now, I think the technical answer to that question is yes. <laughs> That's the wrong answer, clearly, as far as Chief Justice Rehnquist was concerned. And as soon as the petitioner said yes, but he was lost. And we only got the two rather than five votes we were looking for in support uh, of our view. So figuring out some of the aspects that in 1998 to 2000 when Eldred was being litigated were just distant ideas. Well, wait a minute. People might take these works and annotate them and put them into personal digital assistance. And you know, once they're free of monopolistic restrictions, all sorts of stuff can happen. Believe it or not, at that time, the idea was, well, wait a minute. If there is no monopolist to curate them, they will wither on the vine. And who were the petitioners there? Who were the actual petitioners? People like Eric Eldred, some guy that had a website for which people were typing these works in. That doesn't give you the sense of like the bank vault or the museum. It's some guy typing stuff in. Of course, we are now at a later era. And that's why when you look at the composition of the people at this table, isn't it a great combination? of the visionary, of the personalities that can make this happen and argue and make the case for it. And Google is these days an incumbent, let us be clear. <laughs> I mean, it's not a dirty word, it's just the I word. <laughs> they're an incumbent, but they're saying, yes, look at it, just let us loose on this stuff and really cool things will happen. And by the way, Chrome is a great browser, right? That's the message from Google. And of course, if, <laughs> if they can't get it for free, I'm sure these guys have thought about how much would it cost to buy West? How many nanoseconds of the stream 
of revenue rushing by Mountain View called Search, right? How big a ladle would you need to buy West? It depends on how fast you, you laid it out. Yes. <laughs> Does? Yes. But right, this is like peel off a couple billion dollar bills off the wad, and they could buy this stuff if that's what they wanted to do, and then be the next monopolists of it. They're actually looking because of their ethos, their particular orientation coming down from the founders and just the mode of the company to find a way to just be the best among a whole bunch of other companies that might do it. And when you see him presenting, right, especially for those who do information science or legal research and have just been under the yoke of Westlaw and Lexis for so many years, it's just you get this feeling of like, you know the 10 years that MapQuest squandered <laughs> as the people that were the maps people, right? You'd go to MapQuest and it was crappy, but they had the maps. And then one day in beta comes maps.google.com and you're like, why have we been using MapQuest all these years? I think they've improved since then, but I haven't been back to check. <laughs> so I'm excited about the prospect of a generative platform for which that information that uniquely emanates from our sovereign is available to all, whether it's the person that wants to type it in in some cottage, or the huge incumbent that wants to mix and remake it, or the Jimbo whales or others of the world who think of uses that aren't just the current uses, but disruptive uses, annotation, commentary, relationship to other materials, all of that can happen if the vision that Carl and others are articulating is realized. So I'm delighted to have lined up the technology that we know can really make hay out of this, the visionaries that can push it forward and evangelize for it, and the other entities that are ready to invest the money and the time and the sheer PhD engineerness <laughs> to make it all happen. It's a really tough question when we're in these beginning stages, when to be thinking and workshopping, when it's time to reach consensus, when it's time to say screw consensus, this is how it's going to be, <laughs> when to build something, whether it's a pilot or not, when to be negotiating, and even when to be litigating, if that time comes. And I see uses for all of these strategies as this movement takes off. And with luck, movement is such a loaded word. Success will be realized when, of course, it's not a movement anymore. It's just the air we breathe. It's just the obvious, inevitable thing. Of course, this was going to happen. How could it not? Thanks. Thank you. Um, just a quick note, as I go around and talk to jurists, to chief judges and members of the Judicial Conference and folks in the White House and members of Congress, uh, one of the reactions I'm beginning to get is, this is obvious, why aren't we doing this? And, and so I'm hoping that we're going to make it over that hump and turn something that is somewhat radical into something that's real. So, Thank you very much. Um, I think we got time for maybe one or two very quick questions. We're going to have to break it at too sharp, however. So we got one question over here. Okay, uh, this is a question for uh, Mr. Uh, uh, one question is, are you useful to create a tool that can post bill? Let's just see the old and the new versions of the law that can start to go. Um, there are many ways to interpret what you just said. Um, one is to just say, can I give you a red line? But that's not a useful way of interpreting, I guess. Um, I'm guessing you mean, um, can you figure out what it is going to impact? Yes. That would be lovely. Um, and I think I will have to just say that. <laughs> um, well, it's, which pieces of it can just be sheer computing power and magic to make it happen? Which pieces might need to be explicitly crowdsourced? When I look at the Sunlight Foundation, and the prospect that they can actually try to take the law, which is incomprehensible, including to the people who write it. I mean, I remember as a congressional staffer, we would write what we wanted to have happen in the world and then send it to an office whose denizens I never met, whose purpose was to turn it into whereas, and we hereby, and it would be incomprehensible when we got it back, and then you stick it in the statute. That, that would be amazing to be able to reverse engineer the object code of the law 
back to the commented source code uh, including who was the one who snuck that provision in. We're also looking at a variety of crowdsourcing solutions. The workshop at Columbia is co-hosted by Tim Wu and Clay Shirky, and we're hopefully going to get some progress on, on how much can we do to bring in labor from, from the net and the legal profession as well. Uh, so one more question, and then I think we're going to have to break. Uh, what do you think? So the charitable answer is that it would have been really hard in the late 80s and early 90s to do a comprehensive registry of the law. Um, computers seemed to be harder then. Disk space was much, much more expensive. Uh, there was a lot more manual intervention. Um, and the times have changed. Um, so maybe 50 years ago it made sense to print books and have one vendor printing the books. Maybe 10 years ago it made sense to have a somewhat centralized mainframe based system, although I think one could have probably done better. Better. Um, but certainly today, the opportunity is in front of us. And I think what's happened with the legal profession is, is we've lost a decade of innovation. Uh, legal is the last big bastion of closed on the internet. If you look at medical, financial, many other segments of information, scholarly information, that has opened up dramatically and there's been good effects and bad effects by opening up. Uh, but in, in the case of the law, it has remained closed and I think that has hurt the legal profession and I think it's hurt our system of justice. So. Thank you very much. Yep.